Thanks everyone for coming. Really happy to have you here. Uh, today I'll tell you about security in the area of modern applications and services. Uh, my name is Boleslav Davidovich. I'm engineering manager and uh, platform architect at Red Hat. So before we begin, uh, I should be done in around 35, 40 minutes. So we'll have some time for questions. Uh, won't really speak too much about myself. Uh, there's a bio uh, on the website. I've been with Red Hat for over 10 years now. Actually, this year it's 11 already. And I've done many different thi things, but currently I'm in charge of a uh, security team uh, in middleware, Java middleware part of Red Hat. And one of the things my team is responsible for is Keycloak project, which is open source identity and access management solution. So this is not a presentation about Keycloak. I will use it as an example to explain some concepts, but I guess I will talk about Keycloak for like around seven or eight minutes, uh, probably. So it's not a Keycloak marketing talk. Uh, what this presentation will be about. Uh, first, I will try to describe what are the current concerns around security, what are the challenges we face. Uh, and I'll introduce what is token-based security, what is it about, and why it's very important. Then in the second part of the presentation, I'll focus on four standards, so SAML2, uh, JOT tokens, JSON Web Token, uh, and OAuth and OpenID Connect, which are quite tied together. And then in the third part of my talk, I will uh, use Keycloak as an example. I'll explain concepts of identity brokering, how you can externalize security from your application. Uh, and then I'll, at the very end, I'll tell also about quite useful use cases with Kerberos and so on. Okay, we are all, the older uh, among us have right to complain. I'm getting older so I can complain. It used to be much simpler, especially where majority of applications were server-side, right? We had this black box with all the logic, data, and web layer, browser database, uh, some storage with users. The whole security was really collect credentials, compute a hash, compare with what's in database, that's all. And this old architecture was pretty nice and easy because everything was on server side. Uh, we were using passwords and session management was very simple. Logout user just invalidate the session on the server and that's all. That's not how it works right now, right? There are many issues with this. Uh, first of all, passwords are not very convenient. There are many different problems with them. Nearly every month now, there is a major security break and data pa password database is leaked for serious and big companies. And even though those passwords were supposed to be protected, salted, sal salted peppered, and whatever else, usually they get decrypted and uh, exposed right on. There are new credential types, so biometrics, uh, and etc. And they don't really fit uh, this old architecture well. Uh, it's not easy to plug them into old applications. Session management is a very big problem itself. Mm. What was simple with server-side application is very complex with HTML5 application, client-side, uh, mobile, and so on. People are used to authenticate via social providers, as, and this is also leaking into business applications. Uh, people expect the same kind of usability easy to sign up, easy to log in. Something which is called single sign-on, so provide your credentials once and then log in into different applications, it's quite a commodity now. Uh, user take it for granted. And there are plenty of good solutions for this. Uh, what's harder is single sign-out. You have different kind of applications, mobile, web, uh, so on. You want to s have a single place to kill sessions in all of those and this is much harder. Mobile devices, oh, that's a huge painful area. Uh, people are rarely using the apps, but they want to remain logged in. Uh, there is basically no way to securely store credentials on mobile device. And if you still do so, 
and such device is lost, then the only way to cut out the access uh, is to change the credentials, which is not acceptable. So all of this leads into more modern security architectures and standards. Uh, and that's what I would like to explain, how it works. In all standards I will be telling about, uh, they are based on tokens. And tokens are very easy to understand because we are very used to them in physical world. So whenever you go to the cinema, you take a trip on a subway, whatever else. You have some physical object which proves you're authorized to use uh, some services or access some resources. And that's exactly the same in digital world. So token in digital world is some kind of document, XML or whatever else format. It contains some information about you or some service accessing some different service. Uh, what's very important, tokens can be signed digitally with private and public keys. Uh, and this is very important because when we have signed token, we can look at it and we can trust it without contacting uh, some service or someone who issued the token, created it. So tokens are also very important because we as developers implementing some service, uh, we can decouple ourselves and we don't really need to care how token was issued, how it was created, what was processed behind it. And this is very important because for different application types, different environments, the process of creating and issuing a token will be very different. They're also very flexible for us because we can shape them, we can map some attributes, we can define what's there, so we can really flexibly define what informations and how we use to authorize access. But still, the main problem tokens are solving is they provide delegation of authentication to dedicated and trusted place. So what we get is we have a place uh, where we provide credentials, the place we trust, and it's a single trusted place. Okay, so here is the high-level architecture, kind of like very high level. Uh, usually what we have is we have authentication servers of so the place we are putting our login password, uh, biometrics, or other method. We have some services, uh, which are being accessed. And access to particular service uh, is based on a token. So authorization decision is based uh, on the information contained in the token. So what's happening is because the token is signed, service free doesn't need to contact authorization server. Because we have digital signature, we compare, and we know no one altered it. Okay, so very quick uh, drive through typical components. In, there are, in many different standards, uh, names will be different, but the purpose will be, in general, the same. So usually we have what's called identity provider or authorization server, so the place where we store user information and credentials. We perform authentication and we create tokens. So this is this component, right? We authenticate there, it's, it's identity provider and authorization server. We have what's called service provider, resource or resource server. Uh, so those are the services or resources which are being exposed to us as a users or some other services which want to access this. Yeah, so place here. And the last part is really user, client or relying party. Uh, so we, using the browser, we using some mobile application or some backend service down the road accessing other backend service. So in practice, either applications or us, or our client, or some service accessing different service. Okay, what's the most typical practical example we all are familiar with? So let's say we work in a corporation and there were budget costs, so there was a decision to trash all mail servers and use corporate Google. In such case, we will be accessing Google Gmail services for cor our corporate email uh, using tokens. So what's happening is we authenticate 
in our trusted place controlled by our IT department behind firewall or VPN. And then we get access without providing our credentials to external service. What's important is our employer remains in control about information about us and remains in control which information is passed into, to Google. So this use case in general, it's called web SSO, web single sign-on. Although more general use case it is covering, it's called federation. So federation means uh, authentication or authorization between organizations. So two companies want to let employees access the resources, but they don't want to give access to their databases. So it's like a trust relationship. So protocol which is solving this uh, quite best so far is SAML2. It's quite old by now. It's over 10 years, uh, version 2. And uh, this is a XML token-based standard. It's very complex, very verbose. Uh, uh, some of the uh, tokens are, are quite lengthy and quite, quite verbose. It supports many different use cases, many different profiles. You can do SOAP security, for example, and other things. The downside is it has pretty high le learning curve and it doesn't really fit mobile. Uh, What's worth knowing is that SAML is extremely widely adopted. So you can take for granted that any security product and a security solution supports SAML or has some integration with the SAML. It's an industry standard. The major issue with mobile, uh, with SAML, and the reason SAML is kind of slowly going away, although very slowly, uh, is that it doesn't fit mobile. And the whole thing is quite trivial. When SAML 2 was designed, there was no mobile, and there was no mo modern web. So it was not really designed having those use cases in mind. And generalizing the problem uh, at the high level, it's really uh, to pass a token in SAML, you need to perform post callback. And in mobile uh, application situations, it's quite uh, cumbersome or even impossible. So there are some RFCs, there are some standards making SAML working in mobile worlds, but those are only workarounds. Uh, that's not a clean and, and perfect solution. So that's why SAML is very strongly established on the market, but it will now only go down, right? It's getting replaced by other standards. And those two major standards are about two and OpenID Connect. I will focus on those. Uh, key part about them is that they were designed from the start having such use cases in mind. So client-side applications, stateless, uh, JavaScript on the browser, mobile apps or different kind of services and cross-services interactions. But before I tell you about OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect, I will get back to tokens. Because tokens are really the key. Uh, I want to explain you very uh, better how tokens work and how they look like. Because if you understand how they look like and what they contain, you really easily understand everything else. So there are three major token standards. Uh, Kerberos, SAM, SAML2, and uh, JSON Web Token. I will only tell you about the last one because that's the one which is uh, gaining the market share right now. So JSON Web Token, I guess correct pronunciation is JOT. It's one of five different standards, uh, which together are called JOSA. It's JSON Object Signing and Encryption. It's worth knowing about it, because if you do anything around security with JSON documents, it's good to know that you don't need to reinvent, reinvent the wheel. Uh, every modern language has uh, libraries supporting those. OK, JSON Web Token is a very simple thing. It's a JSON document, so key value, where value can be another JSON document, right? And a wide choice of algorithms. And it really contains of three simple parts, so header, payload, and signature, all encoded in Base64. OK, let's look at the example. So we have a header uh, here. So it's just two attributes, algorithm, and type uh, of the token. And then what we do is we take 
the content of the header and we encode it in base64 and that's our first part of the token. Then we have a payload. Uh, those two attributes are defined by the specification. Uh, those two I just made up uh, for the demo purposes. Uh, we can use this information for authorization and we do the same. We encode this in base64, we separate by the dot and we put it here. And then remaining one is we take header plus payload in BEG64, compute a hash, and add after the dot. So header in BEG64, payload in BEG64, and signature in BEG64. And it's simple. And it's really all you need to know about uh, JSON Web Token. And this is very important because if you remember this picture from the beginning of the presentation, the one with service two and service three, if you're as a developer tasked to implement service three, you don't really need to care about whole logic and whole architecture. All you care is to take the token, decode it, uh, and make authorization decision, right? Okay, let's go back into OAuth 2. So who knows or used OAuth 2, hands up? like half of the room. So this is a prank. Everyone here uses a lot daily. Here is why. Because whenever you sign up with Google or Facebook, you're using OAuth 2. Or when you agree to give some application access to your Google or Facebook profile, you're using uh, OAuth 2. If you ever configured Facebook, a client on your mobile application, you're using OAuth 2. So OAuth 2 is a standard developed by all major companies. I think Microsoft as well. Uh, there used to be 1.0 and 1.1, .1, and it has nothing to do with 2.0. 2.0 is completely a uh, complete rewrite of the standard. And it's really, like I said, it's designed for the new types of application. So what's the major use case? And here the fun begin, uh, the fun begins. So OAuth 2 is not truly really trying to solve authentication, despite the name. Uh, even more interesting, it's not truly really trying to solve how to do authorization, uh, even though out in the name stands for authorization. What OAuth 2 is solving is delegation problem. So OAuth 2 is really a delegation protocol. What it tries to do is tries to define a protocol so applications and services can act on your behalf as a user to access some resources which belong to you. So we have actors. So those are exactly the same actors I listed at the beginning. Resource, or, resource owner, so you, client, can be browser, can be mobile app, can be something else. Resource, so API, someone, is trying to use, and authorization server, so the place where you authenticate and when the token is, where the token is issued. OAuth 2 is flexible. It defines different ways to interact depending on the use case. So if it's server-side application, there is a different flow for it. If it's a client-side application or mobile, different one. Uh, you may want to just get a token yourself directly. Uh, there is a flow for that as well. Or your application can also have uh, own identity and can obtain a, a token for itself. Let's look at two examples. So authorization code flow, the one meant for server-side applications. So I know Picasa is dead by now probably, it's all Google+. But let's say we have a server-side application trying to access our pictures on Google servers. So we click on the login button on the uh, our web server-side web application, we get redirected to Google, and application is passing its client ID, uh, which is registered on Google. Then once we've successfully authenticated on Google servers, uh, by credentials or one-time password, or whatever else, we get redirected back to the application, passing uh, authorization code issued by, by authorization server. An application directly contacting Google APIs is exchanging this authorization code and its own credentials into two tokens. So first one is a short-lived one, like two or five minutes, 
uh, valid. It's access token, which can be used to access those resources. And the second one is long-lived one. And refresh token can be used to ask authorization server for new access token. And that's all. We get access to our uh, pictures. The implicit flow meant for mobile devices where there is no uh, way to store something securely. It's much simpler. So we just, once we authenticate, we get access token and we uh, get access to resource server. What's cool about OAuth 2 is that it defines some flexible means uh, like scopes. And you also all know this from practice because if you log in into some application with Google, usually you have a screen and then you can decide uh, what kind of access you give to the application. You, you can give information, your basic information like name and email only, or you can allow application to do whatever application wants on your behalf, like posting uh, for you messages on Facebook wall. So this looks like this, and this is covered by OAuth 2, and I think everyone here uh, experienced this at least once. Okay, summarizing OAuth 2, uh, this is very generic standard. Uh, for example, OAuth 2 specification doesn't even define what is the token format. It lacks really on covering how authentication looks like exactly. It lacks uh, specifying how to obtain information about the user, like more specific one. Because of this, OAuth 2 is really considered a protocol framework, so something which can be used to build more specific solutions. It's not really a full-blown solution itself. Too many things are not really specified too much. Still, what good, what's good about OAuth 2 is it's very flexible. So, yeah, like I mentioned, all the serv all it's needed for a service is really to understand the token, like here. Okay, and the second uh, specification is OpenID Connect. And OpenID Connect is actually something which is taking OAuth 2 as a base and adding on top. So it's purely OAuth 2 plus two new authentication flows, plus a lot around session management. So you have a solution for single sign uh, on and out for HTML5 applications. So it's quite cool. We have several different HTML5 applications, and there is a callback. You can kill sessions in all of them at once. There is a special token, additional endpoints for user information, and quite good capabilities to discover what server is exposing, which kind of operations are supported, or even to self-register application uh, onto the server. So this one is getting very widely adopted, and it's quite replacing SAML right now. And uh, all those big companies like Google, Microsoft, and etc., they are pushing this, pushing uh, to use the standard. And really, what you should consider whenever you're developing a new application is to use OpenID Connect, and it probably solves like 90% of your use cases. Okay, uh, cool. We have new cool standards. I assume. By now, you have a few questions in your head, uh, like, how can I easily start using those? And what about my existing infrastructure? Because we cannot really afford to forget about everything we have deployed uh, so far and happily start using new stuff. Well, we always try to do it, but it's not, not always possible. So one possibility is to use out-of-the-box identity solution. and. Uh, this you, uh, will also allow you to try externalize most of the security outside of your application. So here goes the eight minute pitch about uh, Keycloak. So, but there are other solutions like that. So it's, it's really example of how you can do it. So Keycloak is identity solution for modern applications, services, and API. Uh, which means it provides authentication, SSO, session management, and so on and so on. Uh, it's implemented in Java, but it's not only for Java applications. I know most of us here are Java developers. But the key thing is that Keycloak implements standards. So it is SAML to identity provider. It is OpenID Connect authorization server. 
and it provides very nice uh, integration with Kerberos. I will explain what is a very nice use case around Kerberos at the end of my talk. Keycloak focuses on being very easy to integrate with, to start with. So we have a management UI. Well, everything is exposed via REST, and everything can be clicked through uh, in the UI. So you can do everything in the UI, or you can call REST endpoints directly. And the whole idea is to externalize as much security outside of your applications. So the idea is that security is hard, and usually when you're developing applications, there are same screens, same uh, parts of your application you're developing every time, again and again and again. So why not just put a solution which is covering it? Okay, how does it work? So the easiest way to start with Keycloak is you need a single line of code. I know I'm a bit oversimplifying, but actually besides uh, adding keycloak.js library, that's really all you need. So you paste this code snippet, and you have a welcome, well, you have a page in your application with login button, which is not really fancy, right? Uh, and if you don't need to do HTML5 applications, or uh, there are several client adapters you can use for the same purpose. OK, what do you get? So you have a web page with login button, which you can easily implement in like two minutes. When you click this login button, you get redirected to the login page hosted by Keycloak, which you can also implement yourself in two minutes, so no gain so far. But if you go to Keycloak Management Console, you flip some configuration switches. Then you go to other part, you add some external authentication methods. Suddenly, your application has Re re remember me capability, it has new user registration capability, it has authorization with your already deployed SAML server in your company, and it has social login. And all of this you achieved with the single line and few minutes of clicking and configuration. So that's, that's the idea. Now obviously you don't really want to have uh, your users being redirected to this wire, weird external thing, right? Uh, there needs to be consistency. And sure, every page which is exposed to the user can be themed or skinned and adapted to look and feel of your application. So if you go to developers.redhat.com and you try to register a login, uh, you will be interacting with Keycloak. And you wouldn't realize uh, if I hadn't to told you. Uh, you want to have a special step in the registration process to accept terms and conditions. Sure, there is a click for uh, tick button for that. You want to change the authentication flow, add some other stuff. There is possibility. You want your users to self-manage information about them. Uh, there is a screen for that. And you can also adapt to look and feel so it looks as integral part of your application. You want to allow or force your users to set up one-time passwords. Uh, there is support for authentic Google Authenticator or free OTP. You want your users to see all of their active sessions and manage them in one place. Uh, they can see this. Or you as an administrator want to kick out, uh, well, kill all active user sessions. And you can also do something like this with Keycloak. Uh, impersonation, uh, so impersonation is when you're working on a help desk, something is not working for a user, so we can uh, log in as a user, we can take over his identity uh, and then see if everything is okay, and there is a button for that. So I could go more and more, uh, but it's not the purpose of this presentation, uh, but you have a lot of, in Keycloak or solution like this, you have a lot of typical operations, you would normally, if not at day one, that after a few weeks or a few months, you would need to implement in your application. And the whole problem is implementing those things is, well, it's boring on one side. It's also challenging because it's security, and if you make a mistake, bad things will happen, right? What remains for you as a developer where you, you, when, you, when you are using this stuff? You still need to configure the adapter, although we simplify this. Uh, you can still interact directly with the token. You can change what's in the token and obtain it yourself. 
and there are plenty of rest endpoints with additional uh, operations to invoke. And how hard it is, it is to uh, register your application in Keycloak? So actually, we also simplify this to copy and paste. So you register your application, and then there is installation tab. And for example, if you're using Whitefly, uh, so, uh, Red Hat EAP, you can just copy paste configuration into, into adapter. Or we implement OpenID Connect client self-registration capabilities. So there are ways to do it easily. And again, all of this you gain with this very small amount of integration code you, you, you put. OK, what about the second concern? Uh, what about existing in infrastructure? So Keycloak or solution like Keycloak also provides a way uh, to deal with it. Uh, the concept is called identity brokering. So Keycloak acts as a proxy or a broker between your application and the rest of your infrastructure. So let's say you have some, uh, some identity management solution in your company on, or you at your customer site uh, supporting SAML or OpenID Connect. So you can configure your application with Keycloak and you can configure Keycloak with this solution. So here goes your existing infrastructure. Here goes your application and modern stuff. Same for storage, like Active Directory, different database. Keycloak can handle all legacy infrastructure for you. OK, and the last piece I have is around Kerberos. So again, who knows what is Kerberos, who used Kerberos? Hands up. Like around half? Huh. So again, everyone, <laughs> here is why. So Kerberos is the standard which, was, which is quite old, but it's also very major. Uh, it was invented on Massachusetts Institute of Technology back in the 80s, and they were solving this very hard problem how to authenticate in computer network without passing password in clean text around between machines. So, uh, this is based on tickets and a bit of advanced cryptography, and it's actually not that simple. So you need like well a little bit of time and focus to understand what's happening here, and I won't really dive into there. But why should you care? Kerberos is authentication mechanism uh, in Windows since 2000, since version 2000, and that's why you should care because it is built into Microsoft Active Directory. And if you have Windows Domain, you have Active Directory, and you have Kerberos. That's how it works. So whenever you're using your Windows laptop and you're trying to access a Windows share on the network, effectively, you're using Kerberos. But again, why should you care? Uh, it's all happening behind the scenes. You should care because there is a very nice use case which is called desktop SSO. So you go to work, you open your laptop. Uh, it can be either Windows or Linux or Mac. Uh, it's supported on all platforms now. You're logging into your operating system, into your, your laptop, right? Then you open a browser, and again, all browsers support it. So Internet Explorer, Firefox, Chrome, Safari. Then you access web application, and you're not required to log in. So what happened is that browser took a Kerberos ticket uh, you obtained when you were logging in. Uh, then it put it into HTTP header, passed to your uh, web application, and web application is smart enough to see Kerberos ticket, do some magic, and decide you can access the resources, right? So if you want to Google this, it's called GSS API or Spnego. And actually, it's fairly easy to use right now. There are Apache models for it. Uh, since JDK 7, it's uh, natively supported. All, applica all Java application servers on the market have support for this. And yeah, there are plenty of third-party components. What's the problem here? So anyone here who played with Kerberos can say for sure that it's hit, it's hit or miss. It's very hard to configure. 
So either it just works like this, or you're spending several days banging your head on the wall and you have no clue what's happening. It's this kind of stuff. So instead, uh, you can try to, again, uh, use Keycloak and then configure Keycloak with Kerberos and you're done. All right, so that was actually pretty much everything. So just to recap, uh, there are a few things I would like you to remember from this presentation. There are plenty of existing standards and general uh, major rule in security area is don't reinvent the wheel. Uh, so OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect is likely what will fit your needs, like 95% or even 99% your needs. And if OpenID Connect doesn't fit your needs, uh, there are more standards which extends OAuth 2 right now. There is UMA. Uh, done by ForgeRock, so company behind OpenAM, uh, which is user managed, managed access. And it's again taking all out and adding stuff. Uh, and I just forgot a name, but there is a brand new one uh, doing exactly the same for Internet of Things uh, use cases for authorization be between IoT devices. Uh, so I think there are at least I think there are already like four good standards extending all out and it's worth really looking in this direction. Uh, there are many existing frameworks and out-of-the-box solution, and really please uh, always look for something like this when you're doing security in your applications, uh, because it has community, someone verified it, and so on and so on. Don't try to reinvent films, things uh, yourself. I'll repeat it again and again. Usually, unless you're security researcher, it's a bad idea, and if you're a security researcher, you wouldn't be sitting here. Uh, okay, that's all. Uh, so questions? Yeah, and you can send me your CV if you want. Uh, <laughs> quick pitch, okay. Uh, any questions? Not sure if we are giving a microphone or? I can do it pretty loud. Okay. Yeah, uh, so Keycloak is supporting uh, Google Authenticator and FreeOTP, those two standards. Yeah. Uh, can you repeat louder? Yeah, when you're configuring like Keycloak adapter or OpenID Connect client library, what you're doing is you're putting a public key of the server there as a configuration. Or you can have it exchanged, but yeah. Uh, is Keycloak useful if we just want to use it? Uh, is use Keycloak useful uh, in the scenario when we just want to use it as a uh, uh, delegate to, for example, Google service and don't manage users on our own? Yeah, so the only caveat is right now Google still synchronize users into own database for various reasons, but for future version we, we want to get rid of that, but yes. And I forgot to mention actually last week uh, we released product out of it, it's called Red Hat Single Sign-On, so there is also a supported version. Anyone else? Does it support uh, the different levels of? Uh, uh, does it support uh, the different level of uh, levels of uh, trust? Uh, I mean, uh, when you are <coughs> doing some, something co something common, uh, then, then you can be uh, uh, logged in for months, years, and we don't care. But when you when uh, it comes to, for example, payment. Uh, we uh, want to ensure that uh, it is really uh, that person. That uh, not yet. What you're describing is quite nice use case. It's, I think some call it step up authentication. So if you want to have like less risky operations, 
then you authenticate via password, and then you want to have something like money transfer, then you're required to authenticate additionally. So this is not yet covered. Okay, I'll be around. I have a uh, train in the evening, but if you want to come by and talk and or ask more questions, I'm here. All right, thanks a lot. <laughs>